100 years to the day since it first opened its doors to the public, it was party time at the Curzon. Guest of honour for the evening was Janet Eagles, who, along with her husband Ken, had run the cinema for 30 years, back in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. Today's Chair of Trustees, Hilary Neal, formally welcomed the guests to the celebrations. It's really fantastic to see so many people here um, who, who've been, um, for whom the Curzon has been part of their lives for so long. Uh, and it's really, really important for us all to feel uh, that, uh, that we're part of this place and that this place is so important for, for the community. And I'm so glad that so many people from many years past and, 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 and today are, are here to help us celebrate the 100th birthday of the Curzon Community Cinema. The task of cutting the special cake fell to Janet Eagles. Ken and Janet left the Curzon when the company running it went into receivership in 1996. At that point, the Curzon was due to close, but the man who came and saved it was John Weather. He and a team of dedicated volunteers ran the cinema for the next 10 years. But unfortunately he was unable to be at the party. He was cruising off America at the time. But the Curzon's techno wizard, Andy Darvel, seems to have established a satellite link. All right, we just have it for a couple of minutes because after that, NASA want their satellite back. <laughs> John, John, can you hear me? John, are you there? Hello? Oh, yes. Hear me? Hi, yeah, John, we can just about hear you. Can you hear us all right? Hello? Uh, John, I think there might be a bit of a delay. Hi, just about heard you then. Can you try again? Okay, yeah, John, can you hear us all right? Well, that's better. Coming over the uh, speaking here. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. John, where are you at the moment? Uh, we're on our way up to New York now. Um, this is Fort Lauderdale where we've been for a day, so the next bit's up to New York. Okay, well I know you're on a cruise, so just watch out for icebergs, because you know what happened last time. <laughs> no, no icebergs expected. We haven't seen any along the eastern coast anyhow. Well, that's a relief, but um, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that we're all having a much better time Thanks. here. Thanks, I just wanted to say, it's such a pity that we can't be there. This just happened to turn out to be the wrong time, but I want to wish everybody a, a happy birthday and lots of success for the future. It's a um, hundred years of continuous op cinema presentation, and it's in Clevedon. I think uh, maybe I should go out and tell all the Americans how great we've been. Um, it can't be beaten anywhere in the world, a hundred years of continuous cinema. I want to wish everybody a fantastic happy birthday, congratulations, and uh, we'll see you when we get back from the rest of the session. Okay, John, well, go easy on whatever that is you're drinking. <laughs> um, I think we're going to lose you now, so thanks very much for beaming in to join us tonight, John. Sorry, this month. Oh. Okay. Well, we had it working for a couple of minutes, so that was actual live fire satellite, John Weber. Okay. Did you really think we could afford a live satellite link? Happy birthday, everybody. Several other events during this weekend turned out to be not quite what they first appeared. Who are these people, for instance? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm James Cox, sorry. This is my son Victor and my wife Blanche. We are the joint owners of this cinema and we'd like to welcome you here now. Enjoy the film. But before that, my son would like to say to take a few words. Thank you, Father. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is wonderful to see so many people here for the opening of what we hope to be a great asset to Clevedon. The opening of the original picture house was delayed by five days in respect of the victims of the Titanic disaster. 
The first film shown in the new cinema was of the ill-fated ship leaving port. Over 500 people came to look round during the weekend and the cinema staff and volunteers pulled out all the stops to entertain them. Volunteers like these winners of the Town Council's Civic Awards which were presented the previous week. They are Alex Blees, Madeleine Barley and Amy Cousins. The award was for their work on the Curzon Youth Panel. Before the picture house was built, James Cox and his son Victor used to travel around the district putting on film shows. Members of the Curzon collection reenacted these cinematic film shows up in the modern day mini cinema using a hand wound projector of the period. Almost all the original picture house was demolished when the present day building was constructed in 1922 but for this wall to be seen deep down under the present building. The original wallpaper can clearly be seen. <coughs> Our display has now been constructed round it, with cinema seats and the original entrance doors from the old building. There was plenty to see and do during the open day weekend. But the pièce de résistance, as always, was the now hidden balcony of the 1922 building, which we were told by the guides will one day be opened up to its full glory. As it was to those of us who fondly remember seeing pictures from up here in days gone by. Up until 1973, films were shown from this projection room behind the balcony. It is now dedicated to the projectionist Stanley Newton, who worked for the cinema for over 50 years. And this is the present day projection room, complete with its very modern digital projector. You could say that this is the heart of the Curzon, and it's good to see that in Clevedon the habit of going to the flicks is still as popular a pastime as it ever was. This month, our resident gardener, Carol Price, visits Yo Moore Primary School in Kennaway Avenue to see the garden that the parents and staff have built for the children. Carol asked Dorcas Gall how it all started. Well, I'm not sure exactly whose idea it was, but there was a group of um, parents mostly and some members of staff who formed a grounds group. And we had this huge field with not much on it. And we had a big dig one uh, weekend on Saturday, about three years ago, maybe four. And uh, we all mucked in and dug, dug the beds which we brought along with us and parents came along and wheelbarrowed and dug and we created this allotment area and we created this wild area. They sunk ponds in and that was the basic, the bare bones of it at that time. And then later on we had another uh, big dig day and we built the fence. Um, we had another group of parents come and uh, put the shed up and put the water butts up and that so that um, we can use that. We've got people now interested in making our wild area into a brilliant area for forest schools. So we're hoping to extend this area again and have a fire pit and a log circle and things like that. And do the children come over and enjoy it? Yes, they do. They come out once a week, sometimes more. So some teachers do bring them out quite a bit. They love coming out here. And actually, some children will find it hard to sit still in the classroom, come out here and, and the, the freedom of wandering around so is actually really there. beneficial. There's lots of lessons they can learn while they're here, can't they? There's counting, well, they can. following instructions. Yeah, that's right, but it's also learning about real things around them because they have to do certain things in the curriculum, but to come out here and actually learn about planting or a seed or which bugs go on which plants or what things actually look like in the ground because they may never have seen actually what a broad bean plant looks like or what a potato plant looks like. Some of the children are surprised when the potatoes are actually in the soil, not on the plant. So that's really brilliant for them. This is fun! 
also there's that lovely area just outside the fence which has blossom on from which you can see here. Tell me about that. That's right. That's obviously our little orchard, which again we sort of we really wanted to have something like that in the grounds. Um, we had it was really cold, wintry day, I think in January. We had a willow lady come in at the same time and she was making a lovely willow circle in the infant school playground at the time. And then we had children come out here and we planted these fruit trees. I think one of them perished over the year, but um, they're starting to come on and they did have some small fruit on at a time, but obviously keeping the children off the little apples when they come. It's good for the children to see it from the tray, the blossom, then the fruit, and then the That's tree. right, That's especially, really especially when they were involved with planting them, um, because again, some of them can't actually envisage an apple tree, the apples, and then coming, where do they come from? So that's quite nice to see the full cycle for that. There's also an excellent composting scheme here, isn't there? Would you like to say something about Tony and his wonderful... Yes, well, our lovely caretaker, he, he goes round and collects all the compost buckets at the end of the, you know, of the day and brings them up here. Along with that, if he's doing work around the grounds or if he's sort of collecting up and tidying up, he brings the bits and bobs that he finds and old soil and things up here so that this is always constantly topped up and it does make brilliant compost. Actually, some of the best fun the children have had is when we've lifted the door and pulled out and the worms and centipedes in there, it keeps them entertained for ages. So how are the beds split up? Are they in any particular order or named? Well, at the moment, they are year group beds. So um, I think I can see that's reception over there and that's year one there. So when the children come out, they work on their year group bed. Nice water system over by the shed. Yes, we have. Um, we haven't had much rain yet this year, apart from very recently. So when we came up to water our trees, one of my year groups was doing some tree planting. We did struggle a little bit with that um, because the water butt was empty. But we have a system that we somehow managed to sort out a tap in the corner that leads across them to the school. So that was full of water at the time, so it was okay. But yeah, the water is all... But then water in a garden is always a problem if you haven't got mains, so... You're welcome. What have you been doing today in the garden? Um, planting some flowers. Okay, and what are those flowers for? Um, beef friendly. That's right, they're, they're plants that bees like, aren't they? And you've been doing a very good job there with the strawberries. What have you been doing? Um, pulling out the weeds. We had to get a big spade, stab it in the mud. So you dig, dug. You put the set spade in the soil, you did And then I um, pulled it up, and then I put it in the wheelbarrow. What have you been doing in the garden today? Pulling out weeds. Oh, well done. Did you like doing that? Yes. Yeah. And what, what, is, what is in there that's, that's growing as well as the weeds? Strawberries. Oh, strawberries. So what have you been doing in the garden this afternoon? Weeding. Weeding, that's a really important job, isn't it? What's growing in that bed with the weeds? Strawberries. Strawberries. Well done. And what have you been planting in the tubs? Um, flowers that bees like. Council Chairman, Councillor Chris Blades, chose the Curzon Cinema as the location for this year's civic service in recognition of its forthcoming centenary celebrations. Many local dignitaries were in attendance, including the MP for the area, Dr Liam Fox. <laughs> During the service, the town's annual awards were presented. Anne Jenkins, who had been one of the organisers of the Cleveland Flower Show for over 46 years, was the first to be presented. John Hulse, the retiring chairman of the local branch of the Royal British Legion, was unable to be present. He is also treasurer of the hospital transport group Clevedon Care. We will remember that. We will remember that. Mike Thomas also received an award in recognition of his work with the Clevedon Rugby Club. The service.
service was led by Captain William Slade from the Clevedon Salvation Army and the organist was Richard Lennox. The project was to clean the brass name plaques on the pier to raise money. The problem was finding the right ones amongst the 10,000 plucks that people have donated over the years. But the members of the first Clevedon Scouts, under the watchful eye of their leader, Tina Clark, were not deterred. Look at the middle bit and look at the edge of this. Look at the middle bit, it's well more shiny. Keep going, that one should be shiny. Running. That one needs another go, although it looks like it's been done today, but I think I'd like that a bit more polished. So, Fisher, yeah. your, that one there. That's not bad, not bad. Yeah, 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 yeah rub as hard as you can, that's it, you're getting a good shine on that. Yeah. Out the way, Jack. Oh. Oh. Lovers of brown sauce on their food should turn away at this point. If it can be used to clean dirty brass, one has to ask, what is it doing to your stomach? <laughs> now give it a good rub with yours, Max, and swap when your hand gets tired and let Jack do some. That's it, it's coming. £125 was raised during the afternoon, split equally between the pier and the scout troop. Some of the saplings we saw being planted last month in the newly developed glebe next door to St Andrew's Church have been stolen. 420 were planted and the leader of the project, Eric Holdsworth, tells us that at least 20 have been stolen. The thieves stole the plants but discarded the protective sheaths and stakes over the fence on the seaward side of Poets Walk. Eric says that the police have been informed and he hopes anyone with any information will come forward so that the culprits can be apprehended. North Somerset Council has now started to place perennial plants in those flower beds that they had agreed to maintain. But here again it appears the thieves have been right behind the gardeners and lifted half a bed of ornamental grasses. We suppose that it could be said that the Victorian shelter above Little Hart Bay is an open invitation to graffiti artists. But it really is a shame that they have to take up the challenge. And who is Bingo Bob anyway? Following on from our story last month, the bandstand has now received its promised facelift, financed by the house builder Cotswold Homes, who is building new houses in Strode Road. North Somerset Council and the Civic Society are planning a full renovation of the Victorian structure to be undertaken when funds have been raised later in the year. Meanwhile, talking of graffiti artists, plain white boards? Well, maybe that comment is best left unsaid. The plan was to put an end to the illegal vehicular use, including parking, in Station Road. The answer was to install a bollard across the Ken Road entrance. It's been over four years in the planning, but finally it's been installed, and everyone involved, including the shop owners and shoppers, are all very pleased with the result. Now only people with a need to be in the road, like delivery drivers and market traders, will have access to it. To other drivers, the message is clear. Keep out, pedestrians only. In a joint venture with the North Somerset Council and as part of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee celebrations, the Clevedon Civic Society have agreed to finance the installation of a new seat overlooking the sea here at the Pill in the west end of Clevedon. Some members of the group, friends of the Land Yo, recently spent a morning clearing the overgrown area and repairing the fence prior to the installation of the Jubilee seat by the North Somerset Council.
Sadly, Clevedon's last local newspaper was finally put to bed on April the 3rd, 2012, without making a single reference to its illustrious 150-year past. Clevedon's first local newspaper was the Clevedon Courier. It was published on May the 5th, 1860, by Charles J. Dare, from his home at 2 Windsor Place, Clevedon Triangle. It consisted of six pages of national news printed in London and two pages of local news and advertisements. It sold for just one and a half old pennies. The first Clevedon Mercury appeared on the 24th of January 1863. It was produced by a young 17-year-old entrepreneur called John James Capel from a building in Copts Road. A year later, George Capel bought out his rival, the Clevedon Courier, and continued to produce his Clevedon Mercury for a further 21 years. After a brief stay in a house in Woodlands Road, he moved production to a purpose-built office in Alexandra Road and installed a new printing press. In 1885, Capel sold out to a succession of new owners. In 1894, the paper's headquarters was moved to another purpose-built building in Six Ways, where they remained for over half a century. The final resting place of the Clevedon Mercury in its hometown was in the old public hall in Albert Road. In 2009, production was moved into the Bristol offices of the Daily Mail and General Trust, where it suffered from a terminal decline and died silently in April 2012. In our March edition we reported that these popular Salthouse donkeys had moved out of their field next door to St Andrew's Church. What we didn't tell you last time was that after staying the winter in this barn in Western Ingordano, these donkeys, who are owned and maintained by Matt Taylor and his daughter Ronnie, now need to find a new field to spend the summer months in. This is Samson. This is one of our original donkeys that we've had for quite a while. Um, he's a seasoned campaigner. Any donkeys that we bring along and, and work, we always put him alongside him so that they learn the ropes from this old chap who's probably 30 plus. Um, certainly he's 30. We're not quite sure how old he is. It's very difficult to age them when they get to about that age. But um, that's probably a sort of on the eight old side for working. But the day he doesn't want to work is the day he won't go into the lorry on his own accord. And that's the day that we won't work him. We'll rest him off, pension him off. But at the moment, he only gives children, little children rides. We don't put big children on him. Um, and, and he's very happy to work and he, and he wants to work, as do they all. And, and for that reason, we're desperately looking for a, a sort of a three or four acre field paddock, maybe split into two or something that, you know, has got grass on it. It doesn't have to be the best of grass. 
you know, it can be a sort of like a rough field really, it doesn't have to be the best. We can supplement with hay, but that's what they've been eating all winter and uh, they put on a lot of weight over the winter because they're in a barn, they can't really move around a lot. They can move, yes, you know, they're quite happy, but um, it's not the best for them now. It's okay in the winter when it's cold, they're quite happy to be in there. But they've been in that barn since October and they really need to be out on grass now so that we can then work them with the children. We could work them now from the barn, but it wouldn't be a very nice ride. Their heads would be down all the time trying to eat the grass and you'd be tugging and pulling and the children would be looking down at a sloping donkey's neck onto the ground and it wouldn't be very pleasant at all. It's not what we offer. And so we are desperately looking for something that we can, you know, close to Clevedon within, you know, a sort of like 15 minute, 20 minute journey tops really to make it viable to work them. And, um, you know, these guys, they so want to give rides. Um, we're desperately looking for this field. So if you've got one available, then let us know, please. This was the sad sight over the recent Easter weekend. The first weekend the donkeys would have been able to work. Even old Samson was forced to put hoof and pen to paper with a pleading message to his friends. Please help us. We so much want to get out in the sun and eat grass. now the audiences at the Curzon Cinema have been greeted on arrival by music played on this electronic organ. But all the time hidden away upstairs in the balcony was what some describe as a real cinema organ, one that blows air through its pipes and plays drums, bells and cymbals. This is a Christie organ built in 1931 for the Regent's Theatre in Poole, Dorset. Ben Snowden, an organ enthusiast from South Wales and a small team of knowledgeable volunteers started installing the organ about a year ago. The organ was originally designed to accompany silent films and to play during the interludes between pictures. The organ has 10 sets of pipes, so that's 10 different sounds that can be created. It also has a full set of tuned percussion and sound effects like the ship's horn and bird calls. Before going public with a concert later in the month, Ben and his helpers have to put the organ through a series of tests.
The organ was finally played to the general public on the 22nd of April. In the hot seat was Bryn Jones, known as the Welsh wizard to his friends. The concert drew a full house. Highlight of the concert was a demonstration by Bryn Jones of the Christie organ being played to accompany a 1913 silent movie called Race for Life, starring Max Dennett and Mabel Normand. <laughs> 